Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for what it means to us. It's our guide, it's our compass every day of life. Thank you that we can learn from it, we can learn from one another. Father, that it helps us to live a life worthy of the sacrifice that you made so many years ago on that cruel rugged cross. To help us to live lives worthy of you. Father, someday, when this life is over, we're coming home to be with you. But until then, Lord, we have a work to do. We have a mission to do. To spread your gospel wherever we go. To let others know about you and your love. That by our words as well as our actions, that others will see the beauty of Jesus within us. And that they will want what we have. And Lord, because of our influence, that others will come to know who Jesus is. Bless your word, bless your people as they sit and listen. Give them attentive hearts and attentive minds to receive what it is that you have to say to each one of us. And may we leave this place better people, better equipped to take on the tasks that you call and you expect of us each and every day to live lives worthy of you and your love. For your name, I'm going to pray. Amen. I pass that song. At the beginning of the service, fill my cup for it. And throughout my sermon, I want us to sing one verse. The musicians told me they're not going to sing, they're going to make me sing it myself. But <coughs> they wouldn't do that to me, would you guys? Not at all. The woman in the water pot. It was necessary for Jesus to pass through Samaria. Since the Samaritans were hated by the Jews, many of the strict Jews traveled from Judea to Galilee, took a route around Samaria, even though that route took much more time. But for those who were trying to make the best time, it was faster to go through Samaria and Judea and Galilee. Thus, a necessary necessity must be understood in a different way. Jesus went to Samaria to give the Samaritans what he had given to Nicodemus in chapter 3. The offer of eternal life by being born again. Furthermore, by going to Samaria and bringing the gospel to the despised Samaritans, he showed that he was above the Jewish prejudice. No one could deal with people the way that Jesus did. No one had to tell Jesus what was in the heart of man because he already knew. The Lord was and is the greatest psychologist. Jesus encountered all kinds of people. <coughs> The Bible says that Jesus must need to go through Samaria. Everything Jesus did was according to design. This was a divine necessity. The Jews did everything they could to avoid traveling through Samaria. But Jesus had no reason to live by such culture restrictions. The route through Samaria was shorter, and that was the route he took. There was a woman who was going to be there in a little while who had a need. And the Lord Jesus was coming to meet that need. We are going to follow a simple approach in our study this morning. I want to share with you these three things, the well, the woman, and the water pot. First of all, in verse 6 it says, Jacob was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about no number. In this verse it tells us that Jacob's well was on the property originally owned by Jacob. It was not a spring well, fed well, but a well into which the water seeped from rain and dew, collecting at the bottom. <clears throat> Wells are almost always located outside the city along the main road. Twice each day, morning and evening, the women would draw the water from the well. What this woman come at noon. However, probably to avoid meeting people who knew of her reputation, Jesus gave this woman an extraordinary message about fresh and pure water which that could quench her spiritually forever. This woman was a Samaritan, a member of the hated mixed race. She was known to be living in sin, and it was a public disgrace. No respectable Jewish man would talk to a woman under such circumstances, but you we know Jesus did, didn't he? The gospel is for everybody, no matter what he or she is what their race is, their social position, or their past sins were. We too must be prepared to share the gospel any time and any place. Jesus crossed all barriers to share the gospel. 
and we who follow him must do no less. We can learn something about our Lord from this picture. We can learn that our need is just like a magnet to Jesus. I don't know what your need may be today, but I do know that Jesus is here to draw to you your very need. There is no need in a person's life that Jesus isn't able to meet. I don't know if you've noticed the sign this week that Dorian has put on the board on Monday. There's never a prayer that I've said to God that he couldn't answer. What are you asking God to meet you today? Regardless of what it is, he can meet that very need, regardless of it's big or small to you. But nothing is impossible with God. Let's sing the verse, first verse, friends. Like the woman at the well I was seeking, for things that could not satisfy. But then I heard my Savior speak, draw from the well, never shall run dry. Are you thirsty this morning? Are you weary? Are you worn? Are you sad? Are you empty? Then I pray that you will come to the well that will never will run dry. First verse, of course. Herself. 
Let's look at how our Lord brought her to that place. The place where he meets us in the deepest, most tender parts of our hearts. The place most wounded, most unredeemed. Let's see if we can get a picture of this woman. In some ways, she was a kind of an outcast. The men liked her quite well, and she liked the men. Evidently, this woman did not share the same feelings about this woman. The other women did not care about her. She was coming to the well at the time that the other women had come and gone long ago. Another picture of this woman is one of a person loaded with prejudice and hostility, sin and shame. She sees Jesus sitting at the well knowing he is a Jew, and she just loads her gun. She is quick-minded and short of a sharp tongue. Jesus engages her into a conversation. You will find that he makes two requests of her. Look in verse 7. He asks the woman for a drink. Think about that statement. Here is the one who created everything, and he's asking her to give him a drink. She wasn't expecting Jesus to ask her for a drink of water. As a matter of fact, she wasn't expecting him to say anything to her at all. She comes down to that well with her water pot. She has been up and down the same path many times before. As Jesus asks her for a drink, she gives him a pretty snappy answer. I want you to notice something in verse 9. It says, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? When you look at her answer, she touches the basis of prejudice. Prejudice is something we need to guard against. Are we sometimes prejudiced towards others at times? Perhaps those who are different than us? I want you to know now that if you are taken on the nature of Jesus, <coughs> there's no room to be prejudiced. <coughs> Laws can't take prejudice out of people's heart. It takes the work of Christ to do that. She responds with prejudice, and Jesus responds in return with love. Look at verse 10, Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would ask him, and he would have given you living water. There are many beautiful pictures of salvation in the Bible, and this one is a beautiful one as well. Jesus pictures salvation as taking a drink of water. I was surprised at the time salvation is pictured as taking a drink of water. For example, in Isaiah, everyone whose thirst come to the water and drink. Revelation 22 and 17 says, Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. When Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, he told her of a living water that he could always supply. This image is used again, again as Christ invites anyone to come and drink the water of life. The gospel is unlimited in scope. All people everywhere may come. Salvation cannot be earned, but God gives it freely to us. We live in a world desperately thirsty for our living water, and many are dying of thirst today. But it's not too late. Let us do our part and invite others to come and drink at the living water. This is just how free salvation is. It is simple as taking a drink of water. Reasons many don't come to Jesus as their Savior is because others make the gospel so hard. Jesus made it so simple that even a little child can understand it. There are people in this world today who are going from well to well, trying to satisfy a spiritual need in their life, but never will find it apart from Jesus Christ. Jesus gets this woman's attention, and he gets her attention by telling her that if she would ever drink of this water, she will never thirst again. Verse 2 says of that song, There are millions in this world who are craving the pleasures earthly things afford, but none can watch the wondrous treasure that I find in Jesus Christ, my Lord. You want to try the second one?
and Jared the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? A lot of people have a water pot. When you meet Jesus, you don't need it anymore. She brought the water pot to get the water of the world. She leaves it because she don't need the water of the world anymore. She has become a new witness for Christ. She goes and tells the man to come and see a man who told her all the things that she did. Is this not the Christ? This woman who had been such a sinful person, an outcast of the city, had now become a great soul winner for Christ. Her words were, come, see a man. There was better invitation, no better invitation rather than that. The Samaritan woman immediately shared her experience with others. Despite her reputation, many took her invitation and came out to meet Jesus. Sometimes we as Christians excuse ourselves from witnessing by saying that family or friends aren't ready to believe. But Jesus, however, makes it clear that around us is a continual harvest and waits to be reaped. Don't let Jesus find us making excuses, friends. Look around and you will find people ready to hear God's word. Every day we come in contact with people who are without the Lord. We have family members, friends, children, spouses, daughters, and sons who are without the Lord. I pray that you're living your life that is pleasing to them, it's pleasing rather to God, and that they will see that the living water for you is Jesus Christ, and that you want to share it with others. The last verse says, So my children, if the things this world gave you leaves hunger that won't pass away, my blessed Lord will come and save you if you kneel to him and humbly pray. <clears throat> what do you need of Christ this morning? Is it your prayer this morning that the Lord will fill your cup? That you will lift it up in faith, knowing that he will fill it, overflowing? Like that children's time Richard did a couple years ago with the water. Jonathan still talks about that. How he had that jug of water and he kept pouring the water. There was always more in the jug. But this is like Christ. You will never run dry. We go to him again and again and again. And he's always there to give us the living water of Christ. And if you're here this morning that you may be grown weary. You may be facing things in your life that no one else perhaps knows anything about. Come to this living water. He is here this morning. And that you will never, ever thirst again. Let's sing the chorus again. Fill my cup, Lord, as we go before him in a time of prayer. And spend time in his presence. Asking him and telling him about our needs. And he's here this morning, dear friends, to meet you at your every point of being, regardless of what it is, regardless of how big or small it may be. May you come to him in faith this morning. You will lay it all at his feet, and then he will give you grace and strength for you to do that. Let's sing the chorus. 